Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. This is our time during the week where we get together to study the Word of God, factor the truth of God's Word into our lives, and hopefully into your life as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you want to open your Bibles to John chapter 6, here in a couple of moments we'll continue in our study with verse 60. Let's bring everyone in this morning. Gentlemen, how are you all doing today? I am great. Well. great. We were playing around with the updates to Zoom. And there's an AI companion now, and I'm not going to turn that on because my intelligence is limited enough. I don't need any artificial intelligence hobbling me. You might find you'll have better co-hosts with you, John, if you did get the AI in there. You might, you might find we're very replaceable. It would be just as persnickety as you guys are. <laughs> be able to go back and watch all of our studies and say, okay, I need to act like Brian, you know, or I need to act like Bob. And, okay. Uh, let's see. And we're doing fine. Good. It's good. Be back. I, I guess I've been gone for what? Three, three weeks. So, and, and incidentally, I'll be gone, uh, in two weeks from today also. And I assume, I assume next week, we ought to say this up front. Next week is the fourth. Okay. Were you gone? You know what? Oh, I bet I, they did the AI companion early. I thought you were here, Tom. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, well, well, well my, my intelligence is artificial. I understand that. But. Well, that is a good point about next week being the fourth. We should, do y'all have plans for the fourth? May we might be have something going on eventually, so. Uh, May the 4th be with you. Yeah. Except in July. <laughs> May. Oh, yeah. Um, July 4th be with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me think about that as we go through our study. We may, um, I don't know if we have any plans during the day, but it probably wouldn't hurt to keep it free just in case. And for you at home, I'd hate to take you away from your family fun on the 4th of July. If you live in America, that's a special day. If you don't, well, it could be your birthday and be a special day. So who knows? All right, let's see. We have Caleb with us. We also have Gregor with us in the chat room. David Clark is here too. And we have Chris Kramer has joined us. And if, hey, if this is the first time you've joined us for our weekly study here at Truth Factor, we wanna thank you for your interest in the study. If um, you have any questions or comments you'd like to share with us, you can drop them into the comment area that's connected with the live stream on Facebook. You can use that. If you're watching us on the YouTube side of the world, then you can use the chat area as well. If you're watching through the website, which is truthfactor.com, just click on the live broadcast. I have, I have there a little comment area below the video where if you wanted to send us a comment that way, you can do that. I don't bring the, I'm not able to bring those into the study as easily as I do like the Facebook or YouTube, but more importantly, we will hear from you and then we can talk about your comment question, whatever you have there for us. But you can watch it on our website at truthfactor.com, click on live broadcast, and uh, you'll see the same, and basically it's the same stream that you see on YouTube, same stream you see on Facebook, so. All right, let's see. If you also want to send us an email, you can do that. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com, questions at truthfactorlive.com, or contact us individually, as you see on the screen before you there, john at, paul at, et cetera, truthfactor.com. And, and let us know what you have to think, especially if you, if you like, like, if you like the way Paul or Brian has done their hair today, let them know, tell them it means something to you. So, <laughs> all right. So we are picking up with John chapter six, verse 20. 60. Um, yes. Verse 60. Sorry about that. So in the last section here, kind of lay a little bit of groundwork. If you, um, last week we talked about the course of preceding verses, and there's a lot that Jesus is saying here that some of the people, and, and you know, when we get to the end of the section here, he's gonna help us understand a few things even more so. But there are people there that don't believe. And so everything that he's saying, they're trying to, to comprehend in a physical way. 
and they are missing the greater meaning and application, so much so that it's becoming too hard for them to accept. And so when we look at this last section, we're going to see how they reacted to his comments about them needing to partake of his blood, partake of his body, how that he is the manna that was sent from heaven. We're going to see how some of these people reacted to it and why they reacted to it the way they did. Any thoughts before we pick up with verse 60? All right, let's see. Paul, would you go ahead and read for us beginning in verse 60? And let's see. Let's go to verse 66, I think would probably be a good stopping point. Okay. <clears throat> John chapter 6, beginning at verse 60 down through verse 66. I'll read out of the New King James Version. We read there, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. All right, thank you, Paul. Paul, when we go back to verse 60 there, his disciples, and, and this is one of those many times when the disciples are thinking kind of to themselves or maybe amongst themselves, th seemingly outside of his earshot. Did that ever work well for them? <laughs> no, he always, uh, as the son of God, uh, and knowing not only what was in their hearts, but knowing all things that he he uh, was aware of, of what was going on, that they had this concern. Uh, the word in the New King James there is that they complained about this. I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's the same idea of our complaining today there, or if it's more just that they had uh, some concerns or some difficulties in in understanding. And so uh, he, he describes that, that it, their words were, it's a hard saying, uh, who can understand it? I think maybe the idea there is some confusion. And it's, of course, referring back there uh, to uh, Jesus, uh, his flesh being food and things like that, that you now he is the bread of life. And they didn't understand the, the spiritual nature of that. But he does go on here to talk about that a little bit when he uh, talks about the spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing, uh, to let them know that he's trying to teach them from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, some spiritual truths, and not everything was uh, exactly literal. All right. That's a good point. Good point. And that seemed to be the stumbling block that was preventing some of them from listening. It's it's much like, a, again, why he taught in parables. You know, it, it kind of separated, the, it separated those, it separated the people between two groups. One group believed and was willing to hear. The other group was unwilling to hear and did not believe. And we kind of see that here also. Um, Brian, his statement, though, in verse 61, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? You got any thoughts about that? Um, you know, it's interesting. Back in John chapter 3 and verse 13, Jesus talked about ascending. And he used uh, an analogy that we compared to Jacob's ladder, where he talked about the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Um, and that Jesus was, in fact, the ladder between heaven and earth, you might say, the connection between God and man. Um, so the language now is to say, you know, if it bothered you before that I came from heaven, I'm the bread from heaven. So if it bothered you, I came from heaven. How are you going to feel when I go back to heaven? I mean, in other words, if they already are kind of bothered by the idea that Jesus uh, says that he is from heaven, when he goes to heaven, uh, what's that going to do? You know, how is that going to uh, cause them some cons consternation? 
that would be, when you think about those who saw Jesus ascend into heaven, who were there, you know, they believed. But if you've got these people here who didn't believe, there would be, it, it, yeah, sorry, <laughs> it would do no good. They would not accept him even if he did that. Um, you might, you might even, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, John, but no, you might good. even think like in John, in Acts chapter seven, Stephen sees Jesus in heaven. And when he makes that declaration, how do they respond to that? You know, uh, well, they kill him. So if you're offended that Jesus came from heaven now, whenever his disciples are going to declare to you that he's returned to heaven, yeah. that's going to be much more offensive to the same people. Good point. You know, Good point. you've also got, you know, this is early on after this conversation that is, uh, that's causing some of his disciples to be challenged. Jesus is with them. Jesus has done all these great works and so on. And they're struggling to believe him now. What's it going to be like when he's completely gone? And I think so. I think this might be a declaration that there's going to be a time when I'm no longer going to be with you at all. Uh, and, and it's going to happen soon. And, and uh, what's going to happen then? You know, I mean, if, if you're struggling, if you're struggling to follow me now where you can interact with me and I can interact with you and you can ask questions and those kinds of things, at least I'm here. What's going to happen when I'm not here? Yeah. It's a good point. Good point. All right. So I got a question and I'm going to throw this one at Sir Bob. In verse 63, Bob, Jesus goes on to say, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Now in this particular translation, the publishers, the New King James, they capitalize the term spirit at the first part of 63. It is the spirit who gives life. And then when they hit the latter part, he says, I speak to you, the words I speak to you are spirit. And of course they, they use a the lowercase there. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, could there is could he be talking about? Well, someone didn't silence their phone this morning. Could he be talking about the spirit, as in the spirit of the Lord? When one becomes a Christian, the life that comes from that, or do you think he's talking about this just general, generally accepting that true life is found on the spiritual side? Well, I. Uh, the first spirit, I think, is correctly capitalized. The, the Holy Spirit gives life. And Jesus also says that he himself gives life back in John chapter 5. Uh, and, uh, and he says it again in John chapter 17, in the, uh, by implication at least, in, uh, in the prayer in John chapter, chapter 17, the prayer for unity. Uh, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The flesh does not profit at all from the life that the spirit gives. It is not physical life. It is spiritual life to me is what he is saying there. And so the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. They are spirit in that they are directed toward the spirit of man uh, in, in, uh, intending for the uh, the spirit of man rather than the body of man to be benefited uh, thereby. Of course, we can benefit our bodies by following some of the uh, principles and, uh, uh, in, in the Bible and commands of, of the Bible. But to me, he's, he's speaking primarily of the fact that uh, it is the spirit that gets the benefit, the full benefit out of the life that the Holy Spirit gives. It's, it's not physical life, but spiritual life. Uh, I hope that uh, had some sense of clarity. Uh, um, maybe you wish you had AI in, in my stead at this point. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> no, I think I think I think that's a good explanation for it. Um, Tom, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I, uh, I I think that Jesus is emphasizing the the Holy Spirit. And I, I don't know how much you all talked about last week from the standpoint of the eating my flesh and drinking my blood, but uh, I, I think the point that Jesus is making is don't you get the fact that what I'm saying to you is spiritual in nature. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit from that standpoint. Uh, and, and, and as I said in our comments to ourselves, you know, uh, he was emphasizing what was figurative. And, and he's, the point is I'm not teaching you literal cannibalism. Because the eating my flesh and drinking my blood, that's what that would be. And incidentally, 
understanding that, uh, this defeats transubstantiation. You know, if you understand the point that Jesus is driving home here, which of course transubstantiation, for those who may not know, is the Catholic teaching that when one partakes of communion, that miraculously the bread literally becomes the, a part of the physical body of Jesus and the cup literally becomes his blood. And uh, that's, not what, uh, that's not what the Lord's Supper is. That's not what scripture teaches. Okay. And we did talk about that last week, but that's a good, a good reminder. Uh, Brian. Oh, I wanted to make a comment too. Um, it, it's a lot like what Tom said. Um, I do kind of see here that there's a, an important uh, focus on the Holy Spirit. I actually encourage people to underline this verse in their Bibles a lot. And I tell them to do so because I, ha I say, here's a nice statement that if, that if both references to the Spirit are in fact the Holy Spirit, you have a very direct statement telling us that the Word is the Spirit of God. Um, you know, which which does seem to connect with the idea if the word is if the spirit is life, if the words are life, and the word is spirit, well, that all makes sense, and that's kind of what he has said in this sentence. And what's nice there is that we can then go on to say that here we have this uh, very direct statement that when we're talking about being led by the spirit, we're talking about walking by the spirit, however we want to use this the term the spirit in a lot of the context. If I come back to this this passage. I can understand that what we're talking about is being led by the words of Jesus or Jesus, what he said to his apostles and what they've told us. And that to have a spirit led life is to have a life where I'm walking by the words of Christ, the, the scriptures. Um, so I tell people all the time, underline this verse because Jesus is saying something extremely important. He's cutting through all the figurative language and going directly to say, look, the spirit of God, what I'm saying is the spirit of God. This is the message of God. And, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because in the beginning of this book, uh, we talked about Jesus being the word. In this chapter, we talked about Jesus being the bread of life. We say today that the scriptures are the bread of life. Why do we say that? Because the scriptures are the words of Jesus. They are, the, here we're told they are the spirit of God. Um, so we can connect all these things and have a have a deep understanding and not be confused when somebody says, well, I'm spirit led, but you're not doing things that the Bible says. No, 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 I'm not led by the Bible. I'm led by the spirit. We would know that's somebody who has completely uh, misunderstood what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is plainly saying, my words are the spirit. You know, that uh, if you want to know what the spirit of God reveals to a man, it's my words. And to this day, if we want to know what the spirit of God reveals to somebody, it's the word of God. And this is a great place for that to be stated in just a very succinct way. All right. You know, Paul makes a similar statement in Second Timothy, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter three, verse eighteen. After the contrast between the law of Moses and the new covenant, he says in verse eighteen, "But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory." just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so uh, the glory of the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord seem to be used interchangeably, uh, interchangeably here, uh, because the, uh, the Spirit of the Lord did reveal unto us the glory of the Lord, and he uh, also reveals to us how we can become more like the Lord, and we will become more and more like the Lord uh, through a transformation process that takes place as we study and grow and apply God's word to our lives. Okay, good thought. I think uh, we see in some other places that the Holy Spirit referred to as a comforter uh, or the comforter. And so Jesus here, when he talks to them about the troubling nature of the fact, what if you uh, see the Son of Man ascend back where he was? You don't see him walking with you. Uh, anymore, you know, what's that going to be like? Well, don't worry, because you will have uh, comfort from above. You will have uh, the truth of God's word uh, revealed to you. Uh, you'll have the spirit of God uh, there. And so I think that there is a, a factor there that while he understands that they're troubled over some of the teachings that he's brought forth, as Brian said, you know, he, he kind of cuts through all of the figurative talk but then he talks about some things that would be very difficult for them, but that they would have the Spirit of God. Well, Paul, when you think about what you just said there in relation to what 
Jesus said regarding the Comforter. Let me pop that up here real quick. He says there, beginning in John 16, verse... Uh, Yeah, eight. And when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, the question is how? And it goes back to what you were talking about. Just as it provides comfort by the same method, it'll also convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment to come. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts or comments on this? I just want to throw in there mm -hmm. that the will or, or the uh, the the world cannot be converted or convicted apart from uh, its will. There must be a willingness to be convicted yeah. because the heart is, is the intellect, the emotions, the, the conscience, and the, and the will. And so all four of those things have to be involved. And so the Holy Spirit is not going to convict anybody who is not willing to be convicted. And those who are willing to be convicted are those who uh, do like the Berean Jews who search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. And the very next verse tells us that as Acts uh, 17, 11, and 12, therefore many of them believe. And so their hearts were convicted by the Holy Spirit when they read God's word with objectivity and an intent to accept what they found to be true and then to apply that to their lives. And where some people standing here, Bob, listening to Jesus were not convicted by the very words of Jesus himself. That's he right. says, but that's there are some of you who do not believe. And that gets back to the parable of the sower. They yeah. did not understand less, uh, or they did not uh, understand less they could be converted. And I should hear them. They didn't want to be healed. They didn't see see a need to be healed. And so they didn't see a need to understand. And they weren't going to waste any effort at all in trying to understand those parables. And the right. same thing is true with this crowd that he's got here. They were grumbling because too much effort was expected of them uh, to to grasp the uh, the essence of what Jesus was saying. Okay. All right. That's a good, good point. I've got one more question before we, we, we go on something has come up here. I want to, I want to ask or get your opinions on or thoughts on. Before we do that, I want to say hello to, to Marcia. She has joined us. Danielle has joined us as well. And Javon, he's with us. And um, Caleb says, doers of the word, not just hearers. That's right. That's a good point. Um, so verse 64, just a little side question here. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would not, and who would betray him. Now, a little bit later, he will address the the one who would betray, not directly by name, but John will kind of explain that to us here. But do you think he could be including more people in this statement than simply Judas? Could there have been other followers or other disciples who had been with Jesus, who he knew within their hearts they did not believe? But he yeah. also knew they would betray him. Isn't that pretty much what he said back there toward the end of John chapter 2? Uh, trying to call that up here. Uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 24, But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify for testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knows the hearts of every mm -hmm. individual. Uh, I once asked my dad years years ago, uh, if God already knows who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, why not just put us there? And he said, well, he's given us uh, the opportunity. Or, And I'm thinking now more he's, he's leaving himself. Uh, he... <laughs> He's justifying himself because those who go through life never making proper application of his word, they have no one's fault. Uh, there, It is no one's fault but their own where they wind up eternally. Jesus knows. 
but he's still letting me play it out in my own life so that I will be without excuse and he will be justified yeah. uh, in putting me where I will be. And so I think that's the thing he's saying here in John chapter six. He knew, uh, he knew what was in man. He knew uh, who those were that was in the crowd who believed in him. And he knew who those were in the crowd that did not believe in him. Yeah. And he knew that that one in particular would betray him. Yeah. And he knew Super. not that there was one that would betray him, but the one who would betray him. Either. Yeah. That's good, good difference, but a good way to differentiate between the two ideas. Wasn't simply knowing someone would betray, but he knew who would yeah. betray. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, John, I just quickly looked it up and, and, and building on what Bob said, the mm -hmm. word who, at least in the new King James version, uh, is singular when it says he knew who would betray him. And the word who is actually used uh, three times in the, or four times in this verse. The other three times it's plural. Interesting. Which is why you've got the plural pronoun, they. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But in that one, he knew who would betray him. That's singular. Yeah. So, 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 uh, sure, he, he knew everybody that was going to deny him. But that particular statement, we we know it had to be applying specifically to Judas. Yeah, uh, the that's concept. A valid point. Yes. What Tom is pointing out, you'll see on the text of the screen there, when it says, "For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe." You're saying that is a plural use of that Greek word, whereas in "who would betray him" is used in a way to indicate singular. Yes, in the Greek okay. language. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's a good point. So that, I mean, that's going to focus on Judas more than anyone else, obviously, because we see him coming up again in referencing to that. Good point. Good point. And what do you think about this? We'd like to hear from you. If you have joined us, as we mentioned earlier on the Facebook side of the world, then feel free to drop in a comment on this live video stream. If you're watching us or joined us through the YouTube side, you can use the chat area there. Or if you're on our website, which is truth, truthfactor.com, you can go to live broadcast, watch us there. And there's a comment section built into the page where it would, would allow you to drop in a comment and then it would be sent to us. And if you want to email us individually or even as a group, you see it on the screen there, uh, questions at truthfactorlive.com. We monitor that as well as you can send email to us individually based on our first name followed by truthfactor.com or at truthfactor.com. All right. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? There, there is a whole discussion we could get into at this moment. And I probably shouldn't say this because Tom will say, let's go into the discussion. Um, one, one of the biggest challenges, I think, on a theological level for many people is the concept of the sovereignty of God. Okay. So how could God know what's going to happen without having predetermined that it is going to happen? You know, so if we say that God knows how my life will end, whether or not I will be faithful or not, then we must conclude that God has already predetermined that that's the way that I'm going to live. And that sovereignty issue has created many theological issues for uh, denominations throughout the world and caused them to create relig religious beliefs that then reflect that type of predetermination. Um, really hard determinism would be a philosophical way of looking at it. But what we have to accept is that although, and y'all already touched on this, although God knows our lives and how we will live. He knows those who are his. Every individual must make their own choice and he allows them to. Um, and if someone says, well, I did bad things because God knew that I would, therefore I had to. No, no. You made the choice to do those things. You still bear the full responsibility behind those decisions. And he gave you opportunity. He gave you evidence. He gave you um the way to make the right decisions and you are accountable because you chose not to. Um, anyway, any thoughts? To me, there's a difference between foreknowledge and predestination or yeah. predetermination. He yeah. knows that that does not mean he determined. Yeah. Uh, he knows what decisions I'm going to make. 
before I make them because he knows me better than I know myself. Yeah. And the same thing could be true of every other individual who ever lived. I remember hearing preachers say when I was younger, God can know the future, but sometimes he chooses not to. I never did understand where they got that. Other than the fact they didn't want to sound like they were talking about predetermination, you know. Yeah, I think it's it's an attempt to uh, to, to solve what they see as a uh, tension between foreknowledge and free will. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but uh, I don't I don't see that much tension between the two. Myself, no. really, the tension is not created unless you're taught that the tension is there. If that makes sense, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, if you're taught properly, I think through the course of time, you come to understand it. All right. Any other thoughts on that gentleman before we, uh, I want to talk about verse 65, cause I think this goes kind of goes back to what we're talking about here. All right. Bring this up on the screen for a second for everybody. Therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. Okay. Context of the scriptures help us to better understand that. Isn't that right, Brian? That is correct. Is that all you gonna say? <laughs> oh, 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 I didn't know if you wanted to comment more about uh, uh, about about that conversation. Right? You got any comments um, you know, about that? Yeah. So back in uh, back in verses forty four, talked about being drawn and being uh, called to the Father. But we have to. The context is, um, you know, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. Verse forty four. But how does the father draw him? Well, he tells us uh, uh, in uh, elsewhere that he says uh, the father draws them by raising me up on the cross. He's going to say that later in John chapter 12. So by the father sending the son to die on the cross, God is calling men to him. It's not the Calvinistic concept that God just picks and chooses, which is, of course, contrary to what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that God is not a respecter of persons. God doesn't show favoritism. Um, God commands we don't show favoritism. Um, the Calvinistic concept of uh, God drawing men, which is to say he individually draws men, is, is absolutely false. The scriptures define this. You, you're exactly right. The scriptures are telling us that God is calling men and drawing men to him by uh, the plan of salvation, by Jesus dying on the cross. Even in verse exactly. 45, uh, they shall all be taught of God. Those are the ones that he, that he draws. Those who allow themselves to be taught by God, those who uh, listen to God, those who pay attention to God, those who uh, strive to understand God and make application of what they do understand about God's will uh, to their lives. And so uh, even right there, he tells us, uh, they shall all be taught of God. This is, uh, and this goes hand in hand with what Ryan was saying. This is how God brings us to Jesus Christ. He draws us to him through his word, and in his word, he tells us about the death of Jesus Christ. We say the same thing about his love. We love him because he first loved us. First uh, John, uh, I think 4.18 or 4.17. And so uh, he demonstrated his love by sending his son to die on the cross. Of course, he, this has not taken place in the, in the historical background of the text, although by the time John writes it, it has taken place. Uh, but to that crowd, they don't, they don't know, they don't appreciate that yet. They have not been given enough for them to appreciate uh, God's love or even God's drawing power. But they will come to appreciate that after Jesus goes back to heaven and, and sends the Holy Spirit uh, to uh, convict the world of sin through the preaching of the apostles and others. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts or comments? That's a good point. Good point. So we end this section here that we read earlier. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It was a difficult teaching, and they did not I, believe. I think we have Paul. a choice, John, <clears throat> when there are difficult teachings, whether they are difficult to understand or difficult to obey or uh, if they're just not how we think things ought to be, we have a choice. Uh, there were some who continued to follow Jesus because they realized 
who he was and uh, regardless of if they agreed or if they had trouble with the teaching or not, that he was right. Uh, and then there were some who walked away and walked with him no more. And I think this is a really good uh, application for uh, for us today and for, uh, I suppose, personally us and also for those that we deal with, that when you teach the hard things, when you share the messages uh, from the Word of God that are ne not necessarily easy for people to hear, uh, or they are maybe a little more difficult in, in terms of understanding, that there are some who will just uh, walk away from it. Uh, they'll not have any more to do with it, but there are also some uh, who will see that teaching and they'll embrace it and they'll follow it. I think this is similar to uh, when Jesus talked about uh, the uh, laws of marriage and uh, divorce and his teaching about that and that there were some who were not ready to receive uh, such a hard teaching. They recognized it as a as a difficult teaching to obey. But in terms of that, they also uh, some would follow and some would yeah. would give would give up. And we see this consistently throughout the teachings of Jesus when he turns to those hard sayings or difficult things that there are some who will embrace those, they'll follow them, they'll obey them, they'll trust him by faith, and there are some who will just walk away. You At know, and point. I'm thinking back of the parable, especially the parable of the sower, uh, where the apostles, the people in general, they didn't, they, they couldn't make any sense of it, they didn't, uh, they didn't want to give any thought to it, but the apostles came and said, Please explain it as the parable. They wanted to understand. And that's the way it is today. Those who really want to understand God's word, uh, they're going to uh, sink their teeth into it, so to speak. And uh, But there are so many that say, well, you know, this is, Bible study is just too hard. Uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just going to uh, go the the easy route i'll become a catholic and let the catholic priest tell me what to do and what to believe or i'll go to this denomination or that denomination because well in some of them it doesn't really matter what you believe or what you do you're already elected or not and uh so i, I think that's always been a problem people who wanted to understand god's word and people who didn't care whether they did or not good point all right let's see we've got one comment let me bring in real quick and i think it's um it's a good point david says it was just too confusing and they gave up he says it still happens today it still happens today that's true and also like at the end of your sermon somebody comes forward to make a confession jared dart jared dart has done that he's come forward saying i am so late and you're in oklahoma <laughs> he came out and visited his grandparents. You're in Oklahoma, and you you came to our study late today. Well, <laughs> hey, that happens. We all have busy lives. Uh, Chris Kramer, though, I want to bring his comment. He says, choose to do God's will, and he, and that's a good point, he, God, is predetermined we will have salvation. Choose to do evil, then condemnation has been predetermined. His consequences of our actions, God determined the outcome. Good point. Excellent, excellent point. You know, this right. gets in what I call the four aspects of the will of God. You've got uh, his ideal will, which uh, is what he wants man to do as the ideal. He doesn't want man to ever sin. And and so uh, that's his ideal will. Then there's his... Uh, his uh, what we might call his conditional will in the condition of having sinned, there's the will that God uh, conditional is not the word I want, but, uh, in the circumstance, circumstantial will in the circumstance of man's sin, God wants him to believe, repent, confess, uh, be baptized and to be faithful unto death. And then there is the, uh, the, uh, ultimate will of God in which he will punish the 
wicked and reward the faithful. And then there is the uh, incidental will of God, which is man's free will. God allows man to exercise his own free will. And so uh, they don't all reflect God's desires. His ideal will is his desire. His uh, 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 absolute will uh, is... uh, ultimate will is his desire and his purpose uh his con- his uh consequential will is his desire uh but his uh what some have called his permissive will i prefer incidental will that's simply what he allows though he does he's not pleased with it uh and so there's where to me there that that takes care a great deal of the of the tension uh we have free will he allows for us to operate freely but he has also told us that if we operate in uh, in a way that's consistent with his word we'll be rewarded if we do not we will be uh punished eternally that's a good point good point all right, let's see. We've got a few minutes remaining. So, Brian, because I think, Paul, you read earlier. Brian, if you would pick up with verse 67 and take us to the end of the chapter, and that'll give us a good little batch to discuss, and then we can pull our study to a close. Yeah, we'll be reading from the New King James here, verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. All right. Thank you, sir. So in the last section here, he does ask his apostles the same question, or do you want to go away? One of you in your comments earlier made a statement about when Jesus was talking in parables, his apostles said, could you explain this to us? They, they wanted, they wanted to learn this. We see the same spirit of in the, in the, in like Peter's statement here. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter is displaying here just as all the other apostles with the exception of the one, and we'll talk about that one real quick here. He is displaying this attitude that Jesus is talking about. The idea of looking at things from a spiritual perspective, following after the teachings of the Spirit of the Lord. Um, great recognition. Any thoughts about this section, Brian, as we, we're closing it up here? This, this is actually one of my, my, my most favorite verses in the book of John, okay. and maybe even in the New Testament. The reason is, I think everybody from time to time has a moment of, I just don't really get it. I'm I'm confused. I saw one of the comments in the chat uh, made a comment about, you know, sometimes things can be tough to understand. Um, You know, Paul mentioned earlier, Matthew 19, uh, talked about marriage and divorce and how that's a hard thing to understand. And um, there's lots of times where every single believer at some point is going to read something and say, boy, I'm not sure I really get that. Or, or. I don't really like that. That doesn't really sound great. You know, I'm, I'm not sure about this. And there's a critical decision to be made at that point. Do I keep going or do I give up? And that's what this moment is. This is such a critical moment. Jesus is saying to his apostles, do you guys want to quit? You know, and they don't say, oh, no, we understood perfectly. You know, they're, they don't seem to have a, oh, we, we completely get it. Instead, it, it seems like they're like everybody else. They're kind of, oh, we just don't know. Um, you know, they'll say several times things like, you know, Jesus, what you what you said offended the Pharisees. You know, they're always they always seem to be in the middle of a conversation where somebody's coming to them and saying, you know, what your master is saying is really offensive. Um, I've I've often said that Jesus can be an embarrassing friend because he says things that upset people, even to this day. And that can be something where you feel that sense of, you know, people press you for it and you're like, well, uh, yeah, but he said it, you know, uh, and, and certainly the apostles would have said that idea that, that they would have said there's a sense where, you know, sometimes Jesus says things and we don't know how to handle that. 
But Peter makes the most important statement there is. He says, well, where would we go? You're, yeah. you're the only source of light. You're it. And that's the thing every believer needs to remember in the difficult times. Where else would you go? You know, whenever life is hard, is there another answer? Is there another way to have eternal life? Can you think of some other plan that's offered? Can you think of somebody else who cares for you, like the Father cares for you, or who has done for you what the Son has done for you? This is the thing every believer in the moment of crisis needs to think about, what Peter is saying here. Where would I go? Where else do I go but to the Lord? You know, there's no there's no other answer like this. Um, if sometimes I look at things and I say, boy, you know, I, I have to wonder, I read something hard about the creation of the world. Uh, what do I believe? Well, what else are you going to believe? I mean, there's nothing else that's going to satisfy the question of what's next. There's nothing else that's going to give you hope and meaning and value. And he says, we've come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. By the way, this is one of the confessions in the book of John. Uh, there's, there's a, I usually say there's six or seven confessions of the identity of Jesus. We've already had Nathaniel's confession back in chapter one. Uh, we'll have a few others as we move forward. Um, but this is a nice one. And and I've often even wondered if we might not be even seeing a very, um, you know, a, a different perspective on the confession of Matthew 16, although timing isn't quite right. Um, but, but again, if John is not chronological, then maybe we're seeing that same confession because this is what Peter confessed in Matthew 16 and verse 16. It's the confession. And Peter is saying, we all believe it. You know, it's not just me. All of us believe this. This is why we're following you. We're not following you because it always makes sense. We're following you because we know that you're the son of God. We know you have the answer to life. And that's why we're here. We're not here because, well, I've never had a question. I can say that. I don't follow Jesus because I've never had questions. I've never had doubts. I've never had struggles. I follow Jesus because he's the only, he's the only thing that offers me life. He's the only way that I can have hope. And I believe him. And so that's just, it's such a profound passage. This, as I said, my favorite passage, probably in the book of John, maybe maybe a couple of things in John chapter nine I love almost as much. Maybe one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, because we've all hit this moment. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to keep believing because only Jesus has life. Yep. And the statement, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ. That's a good point, you know, Brian. This, I like that. Yeah. this is something that we see repeated. I'm not sure if it's if it's just John or if it's across the board all the uh, all four of the Gospels, but several times it is said, and they believed Jesus. Not that they didn't believe him before, but that their faith is constantly being reinforced because of what they see and what they hear. Uh, they don't always understand what they hear, but they understand what they see. They they understand a miracle when they see one. And they know that that miracle, that the fact that Jesus works miracles is implicit proof that he is uh, the Christ, the son of the living God. I want to say a, a brief word too about Judas Iscariot here. I wonder, and by, and by the way, uh, it's programs like this that uh, I think make it real for people that even a panel of, of five preachers here uh, do not always say exactly the same thing. We don't all uh, understand equally God's word. Uh, we have respect for one another, and so we share one another's views on some of these passages. And so we're not, it's not that we think we've got all the answers. Yeah. And I don't think people tune in because they think we've got all the answers. But here are a, a five preachers, and the <clears throat> same thing I think is true on ARE, uh, five or six men who are striving to understand the Bible, better understand it, and to help others understand it as well. But I wonder if G Jesus didn't choose Judas particularly because he knew, oh, yeah, that one would betray me. So I need to make him an apostle. Matter of fact, I'm going to give him the treasury uh, because that would be an additional temptation to him. And, uh, and, and he knew that what a temptation that would be for Judas. 
He take money out of the bag. We're told by John later on. Uh, he went. I don't know what he would have done with those 30 pieces of silver. Maybe he would have put them into the bag, the common treasury that they had. Maybe he would have spent it on personal personal gain. I don't know. We, we, we're not told everything that we would like to be told. But I just, I, since he knew what was in man, he had to know what was in Judas even before he chose it. And it was no surprise yeah. uh, to Jesus when when uh, Judas came to him in the garden and kissed him. That's a good point. And I think, I, I personally think that he chose Judas knowing that Judas would fulfill that role, but not against his nature. This was Judas's own right. personality and choice and covetousness. Like, like Pharaoh. Uh, yeah. God said, for this reason, I have put you in this position. Uh, if a more compliant Pharaoh had, a more compliant person had been Pharaoh, God would not have gotten the glory. Pharaoh would have gotten the glory. Oh yeah, yeah, you'll go. Well, look and at so, the, look at the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. God chose Nebuchadnezzar as the punisher, as yeah. the, the the instrument of uh, chastisement against Israel, and then He chose Cyrus as the one to now release the people to begin to go back. Yeah. yeah. Um, but neither did things against his own innate personality and, said, and determination. Yeah. We're told yeah. the same thing about the king of Assyria when he destroyed Israel. Yeah. He thought he was doing it by his own power. No, he was doing it because God allowed him to. That's a good point. And God allowed him to because Israel needed to be dealt with. Yep. The northern kingdom. So now here comes the question, and our study will be over, and we can't talk about it. Does he do the same thing today? Sorry, can't talk about that. We're out of time. <laughs> and we all one, might have different views on that. A one-word answer is yes. <laughs> and that's the one-word correct answer. Okay. I spoken. Oh, he absolutely can. Uh, but like I said, that goes into the debate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> John, one real quick thought that I just want to tie on this whole sure, Tom. section. Uh, we see the humanity of Jesus. You know, you know, you know don't forget that in this. Uh, uh, I, I read into this a little bit that there is a little bit of discouragement in Jesus. Discouragement is not sinful. It's what you do with it. You know, yeah. and, 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 and we can take consolation when we look at examples like this. You know, again, you think of Hebrews 4.15. Uh, 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 we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was, but in all points was tempted as we are, even without sin. So, so you, you see the humanity of Jesus in this. You're discouraged that people are leaving him. And, and uh, he wants people to get it, and they don't. So I just think that's another another element of this text. Well, sure, Aside. and that, yeah. and he turns to his apostles and says, "Well, you do you want to leave yeah. too?" Yeah, yeah, and I and and I see it that way. You know, I think it's been brought out in this program. I, I didn't think of it, but I mean, he he could be saying it in another way other than discouragement. You know, he could be saying it in challenging them. Well, are you going to me too? Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, but I, I sense it as discouragement. And so, and I see that in the answer that Peter gives, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. good point. All right, guys, I think that is all the time we have for our study today. Any quick thoughts on the end of ch chapter six? All right, let's plan next. Okay. Back to the big question. You want to take next Thursday off just because it is the fourth and it would open up for possible family I, things. I think I think maybe more for our, our audience sake, um, people are have the day off. There's a good chance they'll they'll be out and about doing things. See, yeah. that means we we care about you. But but just know, as preachers, we never take a day off. Yeah. <laughs> and just watch those fingers. Let go of that firecracker before you before you light it, or not before you light it, but before it goes off. Yeah, just not in California because it's illegal here. Fireworks. Oh, 
I never well, stopped. No, it's stopping. illegal to let go of the firework in California. <laughs> I think it was Tom saying. No, all of those fireworks. If it if it goes in the air, it's illegal. That's funny. I mean, uh, uh, if it leaves the ground. So. <laughs> all right. Burning so to the ground is permissible, but uh, setting off firecrackers, no. Yeah, I, I can tell you all about that. I can tell you all about the regulations. So, but another point. Well, I tell you what. We'll avoid that explosive subject. Let's plan in two weeks to continue our study. That should then be, I think, July 11th. Uh, we'll take next week off. We'll continue on July 11th. Um, our study through John, we will pick up with chapter 7, verse 1 in two weeks. All right. Well, gentlemen, all right. I appreciate it very much. Appreciate all the comments and participation from you folks at home as well. If you're watching this, watching this at a later time and you want to contact us, you can do that. Send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. All righty. Everyone have a great two weeks and we'll see you, see you next time. Have a good one.